leader here. Uh, and just a little plug for the CASP special issue that's coming up. Uh, David's group has put together a nice review of these sorts of methods. For those of you who aren't great experts and want to know some of the nuts and bolts, that'll be a good paper to look at and should be out shortly. So, Joe. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about our method called DMP Fold. Uh, this work was done at University College London, although the group is currently based at the Francis Crick Institute. Uh, I'm Joe Greener. I'm a postdoc. This work was also done by Sean Canderthill over there, who uh, you, may, you may have spoken to at yesterday's poster presentation, and David Jones, RPI. The preprint is currently on archive, so feel free to read that. So we've had a, a great introduction to kind of the state of the art, so I'm just going to jump straight in and say that DMP Fold is template-free, uh, also known as de novo, protein structure prediction using covariating sequences. So what do we do? We use deep learning to predict residue-residue uh, distances, the main chain hydrogen bonds, and the torsion angles. Uh, we generate structures with CNS, and then we use a, an iterative procedure to, to refine models, or to improve models. Uh, we've kind of focused on making this, this method as fast as possible. So it takes about three hours or so on a single core for a 200 residue protein. And that actually includes feature generation. Um, often, you know, feature generation is, is omitted in these times, but that's sequence to structure. The, the code and, and data are fully available open source. You can use it. You can do whatever you want with it. And as of last week, you can now submit structures to our web, web server. So here's the kind of uh, the flow chart. I'm going to basically just step through this uh, piece by piece and explain the method. So all our inputs come from uh, a multiple sequence alignment, and that is derived from a, from a single sequence. So the inputs to the method, uh, we use the sequence, mutual information. We use uh, three you know, pre-existing contact predictors, so Psykov, free contact, and CCM pred. We use the Cypred secondary structure. We use the, solvent, uh, the predicted solvent accessibility, and then kind of the the main input, if you like, or philosophically the main input here, is the, is the covariance matrix. So that represents the, uh, the level of coevolution between position I and position J. So before CAS 13, the, kind of, uh, the thinking was that you would use these inputs to generate uh, contacts in, in a protein. And this is kind of uh, typified by a method, Deep Metacycov, which did well at CAS 13. So the input is covariation. Uh, everything I just described, you then go through a series of convolutional layers. So that's already been, uh, already been explained, but the, the benefit of the convolutional layers is that you apply the same filters uh, across the whole input, input matrix, which means that you can pick up local features uh, wherever they are. And then the output is, an, is an, uh, an n by n matrix where n is the number of residues, and each value it runs between 0 and 1 and is the, the probability of a contact. However, what we found, uh, and, and of course many others have found, is that covariation data is very rich. And actually, you, you, know, you don't just want to predict whether two things are eight angstroms apart. You really want to predict uh, how, how far away they are more accurately. And so instead of predicting one value between 0 and 1, we predict uh, 20, 20 values, effectively, in distance bins. So the bins run from 3.5, uh, effectively, to infinity. and the bins you can see are thinner at low, lower distances because this, the information there is kind of is, is richer. And then the last bin runs from 19 angstroms onwards. Um, and you can see once you've, once you've made this prediction, you can kind of uh, implement some method to turn this into a, a lower and upper bound. The method we use is relatively simple. You just look at the maximum likelihood bin and you kind of uh, you move out from there to adjacent bins until you've, you've got a certain density and then you use that as your constraint. So here, as an example, you, you can see you can go from 5.5 to 8. And then you can turn that into a, a constraint for, for CNS or some similar program, as you can see there. And we've just got some examples here of uh, example distance distributions. So uh, our neural networks are effectively variants of deep residual networks that, that have been explained. The, the distance, the hydrogen bond, and the torsion angle predictor are you know, they, they, they take exactly the same thing as input, 
and they only really vary in the output with some, some minor variance in the, in the, in the blocks to, to kind of fit the type of data. So you have the, your, your input matrix, you have a, a max out layer, which, uh, which I'll explain in a minute, which acts as kind of feature extraction, and then you have 18 residual blocks, where each residual block is, is a max out layer and an instance norm, and then those are kind of combined into a, into a soft max output. Um, so we use dilations, so uh, that's a way to expand the receptive field and bring in data from, from further parts of the matrix. Uh, and we use max out layers, which is a, it's kind of replaces the activation function with a simple max, and it allows you to quickly build in non-linearities non into, uh, into the network. So I think really one of, one of the, the core things of, of DMP fold is that we don't just predict uh, distances and then generate a single set of models. We do generate a set of models using, using CNS. Uh, we then cluster those and find a kind of representative, what we think is the best model. And then, and then we take out the CB distances of that model, and we use that as an extra channel to the previous inputs in what we call an iterative version of the distance and hydrogen bond predictors. So this is trained separately. Um, and it, the way it's trained, you, you generate one set of models uh, using the above procedure from the training set, and then you use those models uh, to train the iterative, iterative models. Why would you do this? Well, the idea is that um, if you have a set of constraints in 3D space, they're not necessarily all satisfiable. And so by putting in a, an existing model, you can start to filter out bad constraints, and the network can start to work out, oh, hang on, that, that one's bad, I'm going to ignore it, that one's good, I'm going to keep it. Um, and so you do, we do that for, for three rounds, and we find that after three rounds, you know, you eff effectively it converges, or uh, it stops improving anyway. And then you cluster and give a final model. And we do find that we effectively get one final model, uh, more or less. It's not like a Rosetta run where you get you know, 5,000 different models. You, you basically get one. It's either right or wrong. Or, yeah. So what do these models look like? Um, here's a variety of things. So in, in red is the model. In blue is the crystal. Uh, you can see we do, well, we do well on alpha and beta topologies of, of various sizes. The, the asterisks are membrane proteins. So we do well on membranes, uh, membrane proteins. Uh, and then in the bottom right, you can see the CAS13 target, T1010, where we, where we produce the best model. So just the kind of validation of the model generation procedure, uh, we ran this on CAS12 uh, free modeling targets. Using sequence data from the time, we find that 11 of 22 have the correct fold. Uh, for reference, the best servers in CAS12 achieved eight um, using the same sequence data. And then we can, we can compare the, the actual dis, the, the model generation procedure. So for this step, we're using the same contact information. So we do a, a DMP fold distance prediction. We convert that to contacts. And then we use those contacts in confold2 or in Rosetta uh, using the PCONS fold protocol. And you can see that DMP fold produces uh, superior models there, uh, particularly in the top one. So if you, if you just want one model, which biologists do, they don't want, they don't want 20, they want one, uh, DMP fold does well. So I mentioned that we, we use an iterative procedure. Uh, does it work? Well, we find that for, for 19 of the 22 CAS free modeling domains, you actually get a higher TM score at the last iteration than at the first iteration. You can see that on the graph there. Um, in, and this can actually move things from the wrong fold to the right fold. So we find that for three of those domains, the TM score moves over the 0.5 boundary, uh, which is what we consider to be a correct fold. And then at the higher level, you, you do get some element of refinement um, using the iterations. So a, a successful method uh, in this domain should be, should be very general. It should be applicable to a variety of different protein types. Um, and so we ran this on, on transmembrane proteins without any particular modification, although there, there are transmembrane proteins in the training set. And we find that we predict correct folds for 26 to 28 proteins in the film 3 set. Um, and you can see on the right there the comparison between DMP fold and film three. That uses the uh, the same sequence data, and it can kind of be thought of as a an indication of the progress in the field in the last uh, five to ten years, really. Something pretty unique about our method is that we predict hydrogen bonds. So we don't just predict them; we predict which way they face. Uh, so that's the, the hydrogen bonds in the backbone. We find that. About, 70, about 80 percent of our predicted hydrogen bonds uh, were actually present in, in the real structure. And we think this ability to predict hydrogen bonds 
um, allows us to make good predictions of complex beta topologies where you know, long-range hydrogen bonds are very important. Historically, these have been very, very difficult to model, particularly with fragment assembly. But now we find that these hydrogen bonds, we think, can really kind of lock the, the long-range structure in and give some really nice, uh, some really nice beta structures, including for, for T1010. So it's all well and good having a protein structure prediction method, but you know, what, can we actually use it to, to, to make inroads to the dark proteome? If, if you can't do that, it's kind, of, it's kind of pointless. So we decided to run this over all of PFAM. PFAM is a, a database of protein families. There's about 18,000, and about two thirds of them um, have an available structural template, uh, HH search, E value of one. And the 6,000 that don't, we call those uh, dark families. And we choose to run DMP fold on this set as a kind of model, uh, model proteome. So before we do that, we, we see that uh, there are some families in PFAM that have structures that are not in our training set. So we decide to use this as a further validation set. And we find that 52% of these models have the, have the correct fold, and you can see the distribution there. However, if, if you give your model to a biologist and say it's 52% chance of being right, they grumble a little bit. So we decided to uh, develop a predictor of model quality. So the, the idea here is you have the native structure, and, you, and um, so we develop a, a DMP fold specific uh, predictor of model quality, which uses the sequence length, the effective sequence count, and how well the, uh, the, the final model matches the initial distance predictions, which we've already seen from the last talk, is a, it does correlate with quality. And we find that this under cross-validation, this, this predictor has precision of 83%. So if something is predicted to have the right fold using this predictor, there's an 83% chance of it being correct. So with that in hand, we apply a DMP fold to the 6,000 dark families. And we find that 1,500 uh, of those families pass the filtering criteria, uh, indicating high confidence models. Although, of course, of the remainder, as we've already seen, there are, there are many with, with smaller sequence families that we would currently consider unmodelable. So of those 1,500, uh, about 230 uh, adopt potentially novel folds, uh, which is defined by TMLI's score of 0.5 to the whole PDB. And we find that fraction to be similar to uh, kind of structural genomic studies that have, have carried out similar, similar things. So for the first time, uh, this CAS, we've seen some good models are generated with, with really, really shallow alignments. And you can see here that for, the, uh, for some alignments below, below 100 sequences, you can actually achieve um, correct fold models, which is, we think this is due to the way uh, deep learning can kind of integrate signal and discard the noise and kind of use a, an underlying basis of, of what it thinks a protein is, um, whereas you know, the, the slightly more, the older global methods uh, would just get kind of confused by the noise there. And we also find that uh, compared to the Baker Lab study from um, 2017, where they use metagenomes, uh, we find that at lower sequence count, so th this effective sequence count is uh, it's the, eight, it's the number of clusters at 80% sequence density divided by the sequence length, which is why it's quite low. Um, but you see at the lower values that, that, we, that we still do well. And at the higher values, we get models competitive to, to, their, to their refined models at considerably less uh, computation time. So how does this actually impact proteomes? Uh, we run this over a set of model organisms by, by mapping PFAM to the organisms. And we find that for human, uh, we can give high confidence models for 790 dark proteins, which is 16% of the total. And on the, on the right, you just got the 14 model organisms. And we find that across these, 8,500 uh, Uniprot entries can be can be given uh, a high quality um, annotation with DMP fold. Now the per residue coverage is a bit more modest, typically about 2% per protea, but that's potentially due to the bias of uh, structural determination studies and, and what people choose to crystallize. So whilst this work was ongoing, um, nine of the, of the PFAM families that we modeled um, had structures deposited in the PDB for the first time. And of these nine, eight had TMLI score of at least 0.5 um, between our model and the deposited structure. And so you can see that we can kind of use the, the continual PDB release to validate P, uh, DMP fold even more. And actually, even if we stopped now and did nothing and reran the method in two years, 
we would find that we could model more simply because we're getting huge sequence explosion, uh, more and more sequences. Um, and we do intend to do that. We do intend to keep it updated and made available as, as part of Genome 3D. So what's the future? Well, uh, we've, we've kind of heard, heard from John that, you know, perhaps it's the complexes and the interactions. So DMP fold can be extended um, to predict these structures. So for example, if you could separate the intra and the inter protein distance predictions, uh, then you could predict the structure of homodimers. And just as a very kind of high level proof of concept, uh, I've taken one PFAM family where we get a reasonably good model. And then if you just add three uh, known inter-protein inter contacting pairs, so that's known from the crystal structure, and, and put it through the, the same model generation procedure that we use, then you get uh, what is you know, vaguely the right structure, it's the right orientation. So this is kind of similar to how Haddock works, or, or one of these methods, but we could potentially build this into DMP fold, and we have uh, a PhD student working on that now. So to kind of sum up, uh, DMP fold, it makes available the recent advances uh, in, de in de novo protein structure prediction. It runs fast enough to apply a genome scale. We have um, a relatively standard research cluster, but we could run it on the whole of PFAM in, in one week. We provide high confidence models for 25% of the dark PFAM families and 16% of human protein uniprot entries that, that don't have structures. Uh, the preprint is available. We hope to have it out soon, published. As I said, code and data completely available. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, and you can submit jobs to the server as well. Uh, I believe poster A61 is still up. Um, and so if you want to hear more about that, come see us later. With that, I'd just like to thank UCL and the Francis Crick Institute, our institutions, um, the European Research Council who, who funded, funded the work. This is a picture of our group. Uh, I'd like to thank the 3D SIG and ISCB Travel Fellowship, who, who kindly funded uh, my, my, my trip to be here. And finally, thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Questions? To the mics, questions? Yeah. <laughs> very nice talk. Um, I noticed that in your PFAMs that you tested, mm. you have cellular organisms all down the line. Have yeah. you tried DMP fold on viral sequences? Um, Viruses I mean, are kind of out there, especially bacteriophages, have extremely divergent. I mean, effects. we haven't studied that on a kind of whole organism level or whole viral level. Uh, of course, there were, there were some you know, significant number of viral structures in the last CASP uh, where we did, we did okay. We, um, so, you know, the method does, does work on those. I think really the, the quality of the alignment is key. Mm -hmm. um, and so as, as long as you can get a deep alignment, um, you, can, you can produce models. Great, thank you. Uh, anyway, hi. Um, the 75% of PFAM families where you did not make a model, or, or your quality assessment said the model was not good enough. Yeah. Is, it, is there something special about these, or, or is it just that they're smaller? Um, I mean, the model, the, the predictor uses... So the model quality predictor uses sequence length, effective sequence count, and uh, how well the model fits the distance prediction. So, I mean, the most important thing in, that, in, in, that, in those three is the effective sequence count. So it, it's generally smaller families, yeah, and, and uh, larger proteins as well. Um, yeah, I was intrigued by your, <clears throat> your primer on um, co complex prediction, and I was wondering, have you already tried, or have you already seen, you would expect some overlap between the, um, the, the cross-dimer interactions and the ones that you previously mentioned yeah. are uh, unresolvable in a, in a 3D model that you have to filter out during the iterations. Have you already seen whether this overlap is there and how big it is? Yeah, so, I mean, we, cur currently when you, when you train a contact predictor, you, you exclude the interprotein uh, contacts, and so we've kind of been looking at training a new version w which uses the interprotein contacts and whether we can filter those out, and so far it's been very difficult. Um, we've, uh, we haven't been able to do it reliably, but we, we have made kind of some, some progress there. But certainly that's, for us, that's a hot topic of research. Yeah. 
Uh, your ability to predict uh, hydrogen bonds. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on how good you're doing, how well you're doing with uh, beta sheet versus alpha helical? Uh, no, we didn't look at that. That's we should look at that. Um, that's something something good. We we generally find that um, we we can, we can get the secondary structures right generally. Um, partly, of course, we use secondary structure predictions as the input to the method. Um, so that's another factor. Yeah. Um, but we haven't done an in-detailed analysis of that. So. That would be interesting, I think. Yeah. OK. Thanks again. <laughs> and let's move on to the third of these talks from Badri Adhakari, who's with Jing, um, Zhang Lin Cheng and another group that's made major contributions here. <laughs> 